Well, congratulations, graduates. I couldn't be happier to be with you today. It brings me great pride to officially become a part of the Trinity University family. I so appreciate you, Pat McGuire, Madam President, sister, and all the board of directors of this great university in our beloved city. I am actually kind of surprised. I've been in public office for 10 years plus now, and very little surprises me. But I was so honored when I got the call uh, that I would be honored with an honorary degree from this fantastic school. President McGuire, I want to thank you for your true stewardship of this university. You have, with a very talented group of faculty and staff, advanced and expanded Trinity scholarship and academic programs. You've created new partnerships. You've expanded community-based groups that support DC residents to ensure their success here at Trinity. And you've connected DC residents with the resources and support that they need. You look to our public schools and you see your future students, your graduates, and those men and women who will con contribute to the progress of our city. Under your leadership, Trinity has reclaimed its rightful place as a leading institution all across our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Pat McGuire, please honor her. When I come to this campus, and it is frequent because Trinity believes in opening its doors to the community, and when I was able to see the beautiful new building that you dedicated, I knew that scholarship will continue on this bucolic campus for decades to come. I too want to thank Dr. Shelley Tompkin and all of the faculty and staff here at the university who have so dedicated their lives to expanding your scholarship but also your curiosity that will serve you for the rest of your lives. So for almost 40 years of dedicated service, I never know why people want to retire, but since she, I think she's earned it, my friend Shelley Tompkin, congratulations. And so to all the parents and grandparents, wives and husbands, aunts and uncles, and the many, many friends who are in the audience today, I know that you have pushed and pulled and supported these graduates along the way. And graduates, we should recognize them too. And once again, to the distinguished faculty and staff members here at Trinity University, thank you for advancing our city's core principles, the core principles of equity and justice, of honor and integrity, and of loyalty. And my favorite one of all in Washington, D.C., we value the principle of falling down and getting back up and fighting for everybody who believes in fairness and justice. These are the DC values that make us who we are, the, the, the values that unite us as a city and as a nation. I know, graduates, you've heard all week. You've heard every person tell you that today is the most special day and special for many reasons. You're celebrating the end of late night cramming sessions maybe just for a little while. You're giving up countless procrastination hours, right? You're learning uh, that Snapchatting and tweeting sometimes just take up mindless time. You're maybe gonna take a pause from Facebook. No, okay, me neither. But you're definitely following in the footsteps of great men and women who came before you that walked these same halls, raised their hands in the same classrooms, and strolled across these campus grounds over the years. They were leaders of character, visionaries of purpose who dedicated their lives to community service. They were passionate intellectuals. And it is good to be intellectual. And they were excited about the future. So in the days ahead, 
There will be some that are cloudy, others that may seem dark. But when obstacles stand in your way, know this. You have the intellectual ability and the strength of character to get through all of those things. Just know that the men and women and the faculty and staff and leadership of this university are going to be following you, pushing you, and pulling for you in the days ahead. As mayor, I am often guided by the words of a great civil rights leader, Dorothy Height. She said, greatness is not measured by what a man or woman accomplishes, but by the opposition he or she has to overcome to reach his goals. So we know that in this audience, there are dreamers. There are moms and dads that had to sacrifice time at home with family. There are folks who had to give up jobs or work two jobs so that you could sit here today. I know that many of you have overcome tremendous odds to get there. And as I thought about speaking to you today, I wanted to share three hopes I have for all of you. And my first hope is that you are mindful, brave, and bold enough to find your job. Not the job someone else has picked out for you, but your passion, your vocation. The thing that will, when you wake up in the morning, make you run out the door and be happy to do it. So we're not talking about a job in the traditional sense, but talking about that thing that will drive you for the rest of your life. I think about my own path, and I remember, Pat is right, I grew up five minutes from here, North Michigan Park, and my path may not be all that different than yours. I have uh, uh, the, the blessing of fantastic parents who knew that uh, a family could do anything together if it was rooted in faith, education, and hard work. I would sit with my dad, who was into politics, then our local politics, the best kind, the grassroots kind. And he taught me uh, that those of us who were blessed with many things had the obligation to give back to this city that we loved. Over the years, this idea of helping people took root. This idea of me, who I knew that I could fight for and speak for those who could not, had the obligation to give back and do those things. These principles were ever present throughout my education. I'm privileged to have had a Catholic education and an education focused on developing women leaders. I sat on a campus not much different than this in chairs just like those and listened uh, to the commencement speaker give us that sage advice. I'm grateful for that education and I know you will be too. I've held a number of titles over the years. Going on to graduate school, I found that my passion, my vocation was for public service and local. I worked in local government, I started at the bottom rungs, and I learned and I grew and I took every opportunity to, to hone my own passions. I was a grassroots commissioner, a ward for a council member. I even worked through all the summers as a tour guide, which has served me well, knowing about my city. And I have always found ways to express my true calling and passion for working for the community. So now I get to have the title as mayor and be the leader for 680,000 people in my hometown. So even though that title is mayor, the job itself is being a servant to others and a servant leader. And, and a certain servant leader. I hope that you too will find your vocation and your calling. I know that you all have already had the chance to share your gifts. Just like your colleague, Taylor Gardner, she understands this fundamental truth. For years, she studied the history of midwifery and the vital role it plays in our society. Taylor knew she wanted to give women and children the support they need and deserve. So as a participant in the Conway Scholarship Program here at Trinity, she was excited to learn even more. Taylor not only became a certified birth worker or doula, she also counseled young women and offered postpartum support to them. Today, she graduates with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Taylor, congratulations and keep up the good work. 
Taylor's passion shows why the old adages are true. You shouldn't just settle on a title because it pays a lot of money, but you have to do the things that are right for you and for your community. The second I hope, the second hope I have for you is that you will be committed and brave enough to live your true authentic life. Everyone knows, for example, about me, I like a good fight. And it's not because I relish confrontation or because I'm secretly vying to be on reality TV or Fox 5 or in the Washington Post or any of those things. I stand up, I speak up, and I fight because I know my voice matters, and I'm not afraid to let folks know it. So my second hope for you is that you learn to be unapologetic about who you are as a leader. Remember, your voice matters. This sounds like a simple task, but in a world that sometimes stifles creativity and encourages conformity, I urge you to value your own individuality and continue to seek ways to express it. I think we all under, understand the desire to fit in. It's much easier. Nobody screams at you or criticizes you. The need to belong and to connect with others is fundamental to who we are as human beings. But if we allow ourselves to succumb to criticism, if we consistently measure our worth against the approval of others, we will never be the women and men God created us to be. You cannot live your life based on what other people say, what they may think, or what they say about you. Believe me, if I did that, I would never come out of the house. <laughs> so I say this, I hope that if you march to the beat of your own drum, beat harder. If you sing along, a little off key, sing even louder. If you dance like a person that's from a far, far away place that nobody's ever heard of, dance anyway. And at every level and in every field, especially in politics and government, we see how more women are harshly criticized, more frequently criticized, and wrongly criticized, don't we? We can't let that stop us because every major issue we face today disproportionately impacts women. Some political leaders are trying to make it harder for women to make decisions about their own futures. Women are vastly underrepresented in science and technology and entrepreneurship and C-suites and boardrooms and city hall. I, I could go on. Climate change, for example, is an issue that affects every person here but disproportionately burdens women and girls across the globe. So it goes without saying that we need every woman and every institution that educates women to be leaders, to focus on women of every background, every color, and every creed to do their part as we work together to address our shared challenges. And this is what I know, that women and men care about this issue, about making sure women and girls succeed around the globe. Eleanor Roosevelt reminds us, well-behaved women rarely make history. So if you're overly concerned about being liked or being nice or being accepted, remember Eleanor's words. The third hope I have for you is that you'll become strong advocates for women and girls. Whether it's a blog or a magazine or a TV show, it seems like everywhere I look, we can see some mean girl activity out there. So let's reject those stereotypes. Let us not be a part of the cast of characters that says, well, I don't like her hair. And she doesn't smile enough. And we hate pantsuits anyway. Let us be among the cast of characters that pushes and pulls for women, who speaks out when they're being too harshly and wrongly criticized, and who knows that our world is a better place when everyone is in the game. What I say in my own city and across the city is that we need every Washingtonian living his or her best life, living up to his or her potential. When we have unemployment, for example, in one ward of our city, in Ward 8, that's three times as much as it is in Ward 3, 
we know that we don't have everybody on the court. And I know that is true when we talk about making sure that every woman and man lives up to his or her own potential. I am proud of the progress that we see in Washington, D.C. My family has been here for five generations. And like I say, all the time, we're not going anywhere. But we have to be very intentional about how we grow this city and make sure that more Washingtonians can participate in our prosperity. And when I see Trinity University's dedication to educating Washingtonians for the future that is in our sight, I know that we will be moving in the right direction. Before I leave you today, let me say this last thing. I know that I've spent several minutes, maybe too many, praising you for everything you've learned and the many ways that you've grown. But I also want to caution you from thinking you have everything figured out today. Be willing to let go of some of those things you think you know. Because I promise you, there's more that you don't know. Because as you will sometimes, it will sometimes be the case that you think you've got it exactly right. I can sit here and I know that the president will tell you that we've had to change course many times, shift gears, make a U-turn, go right when we thought we were going left. Don't be too stubborn to learn. You will never stop learning. And you've discovered here at Trinity that curiosity is the foundation of learning. Those who are curious change the world. Thank you, Trinity. Congratulations, graduates.